Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Uh, where's my little button? There I am. Okay, cool. Um, hello, people. Um, so what we got? Uh, Jerusalem, UK, San Diego, Illinois, Middle East, uh, Sweden, Netherlands. Jerry's online. Good morning, Jerry. <laughs> Hope you're awake. Um, so we've got lots to concentrate on this morning, you'd be pleased to know. Uh, who just asked that? Damien just asked if anyone has managed to catch Neowise the Comet. Um, I haven't. I don't know if anyone else has, but if you have, um, let us know. It'd be, actually, I've seen one shot of it somewhere online. Someone posted one with the Comet on, which looked pretty cool. I don't know if it was that particular one, but there we go. Um, okay, so today um, we're going to go into Capture One, as we always do. Uh, we've got a load of images that we can go through. Um, I'm going to try and reduce the number of images that we go through quickly um, and try and do um, some a little bit more in depth today. Um, so, yeah, uh, where we go. Jerry, uh, his buddy here has a couple of great Neil Wise shots over the last couple of days. Um, so, Jerry, you need to send them to Damien by the look of it <laughs> because he needed to see them. Um, Bruce is online. Good morning, Bruce. Andel and Mark. Cool. Um, so there's lots of people on the South Coast, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's not just me alone here baking in my house. Right, um, let's go into our version of Capture One for a start. Um, so, again, quick reminder, there's about a 15 second delay between your comments um, being put on the screen and when I see them here. Um, so just bear that in mind, I'm not ignoring you. Um, it's just the way that streaming works, unfortunately. Uh, we are working on Capture One version 13.1.1 or 20.1.1 if you're in um, marketing. It depends on whether you're a coder or a marketing person. I, I hope um, the next version, we're gonna get that sorted out and it'll all be one, but there we go. Um, so if you go into Capture One, you're gonna see both of those version numbers effectively version 20, correct version, um, but the actual build is 13.1.1. That's got the latest heal and clone tools, but it's also got um, some of the bug fixes that came out um, as a result of the first service pack two, 20.1. Okay, um, let's go into our capture one. Uh, and here's our first picture. Um, so this one is from Michael. I think um, having a look through very briefly some of these pictures earlier, I think we're going to be doing a lot of cropping today. Today's going to be a lot of cropping and a lot of, bit of um, a lot of shadow recovery, I think. Um, but let's have a look. So first off, um, let's have a look at what lens profile we've picked up, which is the right one. Um, so Sony 24 to 105. Um, shot at f7.1 so we've got all that detail down the bottom here it's just a quick reminder again like I said last week if you don't see this detail on your pictures it's because your labels are hidden so you need to go to the view menu go to customize viewer and make sure that tick is on labels otherwise you're not going to see the detail for that shot um, so with that all set we don't need diffraction correction typically on that sort of a lens at this sort of um, aperture it's generally pretty sharp it's loaded in some distortion profile already because it was pretty wide um, we touched on that last week but basically capture one will load in the distortion correction if it thinks that that lens at that width needs it you can always override it um, but generally try and avoid using it unless you really have to especially um, unless you're doing something like an architecture shot um, where it has to be straight lines completely straight lines um, that way you don't lose anything off the sides so for instance if i went to the crop um, actually in this one in this case here as a result of that distortion correction for that lens we've lost quite a lot of the space on that um in that picture let me just uh reset yeah so um if i bring that distortion correction back look there we go actually this is a very good very good example so on here i don't know michael whether you had a filter installed on the lens or not but you've got a little bit of vignetting up here which would suggest that's possibly a filter holder going on there. Um, but either way, as a result of that distortion correction, if you look at these edges here along this picture, and if I dial in that distortion correction up to 100, which is where we were, you see it's got rid of that stuff. It's got rid of the vignetting and it's pulled the picture out. It's, it's effectively stretched it out. But look at what it's done. When I go to the crop tool, look at what it's done to do that. So you've lost a lot of this information on the sides. That's fine in the case of something like this. So this sort of an image, that's okay. It's a landscape image. The stuff on the side is pretty abstract. It's another cloud, it's a bit more tree and so on. But if you're doing something like a shot in a city um, and you have that distortion correction dialed in, just be really conscious that as a result of trying to correct for the lens distortion, you might be chopping off a lot of stuff on the side. So if ever you see that distortion correction dialed in at 100 in Capture One, 
First thing I'd do is go to the crop tool just to check what it's done to fix that distortion. You might want to undo it or you might want to dial it back a little bit if you're worried about um, missing content from the sides. Okay, so in this case, it's fine. Um, there's no issue in there and actually we're going to get a bit more extreme with our crop because to me, the first thing that screams out on this one, I like the negative space up here, but it depends on the purpose. If this was for a magazine, you needed some room for text, then that's wonderful to have the negative space up there. For me, on a wall, I'd like to see this more panoramic, so maybe one by two. So we go to our crop tool, hold it down. You can choose these dimensions down here, or of course, we could actually type it in to the crop box. Um, we can even put a ratio in there as well if we wanted to. So I'm going to set it at one by two, which is quite a narrow, sorry, quite a wide um, sort of letterbox crop. We've got a decision as to whether we want to keep this tree in or not. We'll leave it in for now. Um, and what I'm using is that sort of one third grid line there just to make sure that the tree is hanging from that one third point. Um, so it doesn't have to, we don't have to have the main part of the tree on the one third line. We're not going to play with the rules like that um, in this session. But it's a good idea to have something, if you're going to have something leading into the frame, then have it cross that sort of one third point in some way, shape, or form. So with that crop in there, that just feels more like a, a nice sort of tropical scene um, to go on a wall. So this is all about then designing it for print. So with that uh, crop done, let's go into our exposure tab. So exposure tabs on the top, the little histogram um, icon up there. Um, we can use, of course, our exposure warning. There's not going to be any on here. That would have flagged in red or green if you've set it um, to flag if something's going to be overexposed or more than 255 on the histogram scale. But we can see from the histogram that actually we're, we're pretty safe. You've probably got about one to two stops clear on this gap on the left-hand side. Uh, well, sorry, on the right-hand side of the histogram, on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, there's a couple of bits down here in the shadows. And one thing I want to really um, introduce to you guys today, especially, is the orange bar technique. Um, so quite often we'll talk about using the HDR tool. So using HDR to control shadows, uh, highlights, whites, blacks, and so on. And we talk about the area of the histogram that it affects. So shadows being the bottom, let's say, quarter, um, highlights being the top quarter, blacks being the bottom four to five percent in terms of that brightness scale, and then the whites being the, the upper four to five percent in um, the brightness scale. So, you know, it could be sort of two, four, five up to two, five, five, for example. Um, in those terms, um, it's very easy if, you, if you're able to look at that image and go, oh yeah, that tree looks around about eight, or that sky looks around about 237. It comes with time that you'll know what's a highlight and what's a shadow and so on. However, in the meantime, or if you actually just want to make sure, um, use the orange line on the histogram. So we uploaded a Milky Way um, pro tip yesterday. Um, so the bad news is I've taken it down um, because I didn't like the sound on it. For some reason, the sound went a bit wacky. So we've taken it down it will get put back up when the sound is corrected. However, um, in that we actually covered the use of this orange bar. So if you look up there, uh, yeah, I'm pointing in the top left of your screen on the histogram, um, you'll see as I'm moving around the image, that orange bar moves up and down the histogram. It's not a coincidence. It's not just a random orange bar. It's telling you exactly where on the histogram the pixels that are underneath my mouse sit. So if you, roughly speaking, assume that anything in here is in the shadow, anything in here is in the highlights, this all this sort of 50% of the middle bit is all mid-tone, and then the very, very highest parts and the very, very lowest parts are effectively blacks and whites in the HDR tool. Now, as I move my mouse around, I might be surprised because what I think should sit maybe in the blacks area of the histogram actually doesn't. As I move my mouse around here, this really dark part of the tree, it's not. It's actually in the shadows. Now, using the black slider might pull it up a little bit, but using the shadows slider is going to have a lot more of an effect because it's going to catch more of that area. So in an ideal world, we, we choose the right slider rather than just playing and experimenting all the time. So in this case, I know that this tree over here, if we look at where that orange bar is over in the histogram, this pretty much sits down in the black section. This here, this tree sits in the shadow section. This trunk is definitely in the shadow section. This cloud here is in the highlight section, but we have nothing in the whites. So if I move the whites up, I might affect this sky slightly because the tail end of it, it's not quite binary. It doesn't just drop. There's a bit of a tapering off. But effectively, other than just that sky losing a bit of color, 
it's not going to have much of an effect, especially not on this cloud. So we think the cloud is really bright. Look at that orange bar. No, it's not. It's actually just in the highlights. So with that information, we can then make decisions on what or what HDR tools we want to use, but also whether or not it's worth using contrast, um, because contrast takes everything from the middle and pushes it out. You can see that on the histogram going like that. So if I got it reset, so watch the histogram as I move it out, it pushes the highlights lighter. Well, the, the anything north of 50 percent, so 128 plus, it's going to get brighter. And then 127 minus, it's going to get darker and it stretches the histogram out. So the result of that in this case, where we've got a nice evenly distributed histogram, is the contrast tool is going to make your image look horrible. So there are a few little, key, little clues and, and cues that we can use in this stuff to keep control of where we're focusing our editing and spending our time. So if I see a histogram that sort of looks like a hump in the middle, like this one, and I don't have a problem with lack of contrast, don't touch the contrast function. Because all it's going to do is it's going to make everything extreme. If anything, if I want to stretch out the histogram, I go to levels. Because levels does exactly that. It allows me to stretch the histogram so I can move the brightness point or the highlight point up. I can move the shadow point down, but I don't want to in this case because I want to see that tree um, clearly the whole time. But I can also use the midpoint. So I can move the midpoint to make the midtones a bit darker, or I can make the midtones a little bit lighter. So in this case, that's going to be a lot better and a lot more subtle than anything that the contrast tool up here can do. So read the histogram is <laughs> number one, I guess. Um, but in general terms, um, what we want to do is make sure that we're getting the best out of the data that we've got in this image. So I've already made that small change here with our levels. I'm just going to correct that a little bit to a little bit less and a little bit less bright here. OK, so let's just go on before and after so you can see the change. So as a result of increasing contrast, what we've lost a little bit is saturation. So what we're going to do is we're going to dial that back in a little bit with our saturation tool. We could do it on a color by color basis using the color editor. So go to the color tab here and we could choose which ones we want to saturate more. I might choose the green, I might choose the pink, but in this case, we're going to bring it all up relatively evenly. OK, so with that done, what this is begging out for is another gradient um, to come across the top and potentially a little white balance shift. The white balance shift is probably not what you think I'm going to do, but let's have a little play. So I'm going to warm this up. Um, we're going to warm it up to maybe six and a half thousand, something like that, and dial back that pink tint a little bit on the overall image. So this is having an overall effect on everything. Now create a brand new layer. So we're going to call this layer sky so you can guess where it's going to be. And with the sky layer, I'm going to draw a really soft fall off gradient as if it was a soft gradient in front of the camera. I think this probably did have a, um, a, a grad filter on it, but I'm not sure. But either way, I'm just going to add a little bit more on there. With this gradient here, because I know all of the sky sits up here in the highlights, so we can see that with that orange bar. I can just pick on the highlight recovery in my high dynamic range to pull that sky back up there rather than using exposure, which is going to have a dramatic effect and cause a line to form across it. I don't want a line to form across it. I actually just want to pull down the highlights, maybe a little bit of that whites in there as well. So pull those both down. And what we could do effectively is pull down brightness a touch. That's so going to have a little more subtle of an effect. Um, than the exposure um, slider just by moving the entire histogram across. So brightness, remember, instead of having the histogram on a skateboard and moving it right and left, brightness squashes, so it makes the, the darks lighter without pushing the highlights off the end of the histogram and vice versa. So if you pull it down, it brings the highlights down, but it doesn't necessarily push the shadows off the edge into underexposed. So with those two changes, we've now got a nice even exposure. We've got a nice sort of level into this. It feels soft. It feels quite calm. Um, I am going to warm up, however, this bottom part here separately to the sky. So to do that, another new layer. I'm going to call this one beach. And with our beach layer, yet another gradient filter, our gradient mask. And with that mask, all I'm going to do is warm up my tint a little, or sorry, my, uh, my white balance a little bit more and a bit of tint. Sorry, I've got a weird throat struggling to speak for a while there okay <clears throat> so we're going to warm this up to a, a lot warmer than where it started from so 8400 on a kelvin scale is pretty warm light but in this case it works 
it feels about right <clears throat> pardon me so finally let's try and bring the focus back to that tree so we've got two ways of doing that we could vignette ironically we got rid of the vignette when we did the crop but in this case it sort of works um, but it's a little too generic it's sort of this corner this corner this corner this corner without really bringing the focus back to that tree so instead of that let's create a new layer focus i'm going to call it and i'm going to use a radial mask so it's still a gradient but instead of being a line gradient it's now a radial gradient um, from the center of where i draw it so let's draw that out now with these masks remember you've always got three lines on a gradient mask you've got the outer limit the center and the inner limit when i show the mask here this outside line on the radial mask is where 100 percent of the mask is applying this middle line here is your 50 percent point and this inside line here is where the mask is having zero percent of, of impact whatsoever so everything inside this circle here is not being touched by that mask at all everything outside the circle here is a hundred percent application of the mask and then this fall off here slowly changes from 100 99 98 97 and so on if i want that to be a more soft and subtle fall off what i need to do is move the distance that these two lines are apart from each other and the way you do it is just grab the middle line and pull it in there and that means that that difference between 100 and zero is now going on over a longer period which means it's a more subtle gradient so with that done let me just turn off my mask so remember on your mask this little setting here the little sort of eye icon in a, in a square m for your mask shows you the mask m also turns off the mask so press m on your keyboard to show the mask and on your keyboard to make it go away you've also got a grayscale mask which is alt or option and m um, which will let's just do that now so you can see like that um, so everything that is white on a mask is 100% applied everything that's black is not applied at all so option and m or alt and m if i want to show the mask only when i'm drawing you have the option here only display mask when drawing which means whenever i move over the image with my mask tool and start making changes it will show me the mask the second i let go the mask disappears that's the default setting but sometimes then when you press the m key for mask it loses the default so just remember you can always get that back by going to your mask setting here and uh choosing your only display mask instead okay uh so huh, question uh from vincent what is the difference between the white balance in the color tab and the white balance in the exposure tab uh so the literal answer vincent is one is in the exposure tab and one is in the color tab um the actual answer is it's exactly the same tool um, the reason it's duplicated is because some people choose to do their white balance change on the color tab sort of makes sense if you're making color changes you might want to tweak the white balance a little bit as well what it also has an effect on is if you ever use a black and white tool um, your original white balance of a color image will change what colors the underlying um, transformation is going to uh, apply so if i make the if i go to my black and white tool for example and say that blues need to be way 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 brighter or way 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 darker if i change my white balance i could introduce more blue or less blue into the image so they have it housed here on the um, uh, color tab for things like the black and white tool but also the color editor so it's easy to access but it is exactly the same tool as is on your exposure tab and actually what we're asking let's go to my details tab if i wanted to uh, i can add a tool and go down here to white balance and i add a white balance into my details tab so you can have the same tool on 20 different well not 20 different tabs but as many tabs as you like um, you can just keep adding the same tool over and over again um, if you always find that it's useful a perfect example of this is actually the fact that you've always got layers um, across all of your different tabs because you might want to refer to layers so it's the same thing it exists on um, your exposure tab it also exists in the color tab it's the same tool doing the same thing any change i make here would also affect the same thing here okay so with our little mask done there so we've got our let me turn it on so you can see we've got our nice soft fall off mask in there um i'm going to now use that to pull down our overall exposure in the rest of the shot and because i've pulled down on that outside part of the mask by half a stop so 0.5 i can go back to my background and raise that by 0 
because I want effectively the, the brightness of the image not to change. I want to enhance the brightness of the tree um, while keeping the rest of the image the same. The other way of doing that, if I wanted a quicker way, frankly, is on my focus mask here, which is sat like that, I could, let me just uh, right click, go to invert mask, and then the opposite would be true. So I could have brightened the tree separately rather than darkening the outside. To me, it just makes more logical sense when I come back to that image that I've put a vignette around it rather than lightening certain parts. So I tend to do it that way um, rather than inverting. Okay, um, there are a couple of bits in here. So, you know, this tree here, we could possibly, let's go to our healing tool. So up on the top toolbar, because I don't have a healing layer already um, set in place, then the second I start to draw, it's going to automatically create me a new healing layer. Make sure your opacity on healing is set to 100 uh, if you want to get rid of something. Um, otherwise, it's not going to do much. And let's just create a couple of heals on here. So this one, it's decided to take it from there for some reason. Uh, so let's move it up to here and say, actually, put some more sky over there, please. Um, here it's learnt there. Actually, I want it from there. Um, let's see if it gets this bit right. Oh, yeah, did that pretty good. Uh, let's really, <laughs> let's see. I'm not sure this is going to work too well, but let's have a little go. I'm going to create a heel layer over this entire branch. What do we think? Is it going to get this right? I don't think so, because I think this is a bit trickier than um, the software is going to be able to work out for itself. And in fact, in Photoshop, I'd still have to be telling it what to do, but eh, no. <laughs> Um, so, and in this case, someone actually asked the other day, uh, could you replace um, all of your other things um, with uh, Capture One instead of using, you know, Affinity, Luminar, Photoshop, or whatever? The answer is, in most cases now, certainly for landscape and cityscape stuff, it does 90% of things um, great. It does 100% of things pretty good. Um, but the, that 10% difference, uh, when you want something like this, a pretty complex cutout, that's what a pixel editor is for. Um, so use the right tool for the right job. And in this case, you would take it into an editor um, and try and do it. OK, um, so with that done, um, there's a little bit of a thought in my mind about the fact that this bright part here behind the tree is a little bit too bright. Um, I'm actually going to just put a tiny new layer behind tree, we'll call it, so that it's obvious really really soft um quite a low opacity brush or low flow brush if you're using that and i'm just going to paint a really really soft mask around the outside of this tree we're going to exclude the tree in a second with a luma range um, so that nothing bad happens to the tree uh like that and that okay so that's my mask i'm going to go to luma range say display mask and I'm going to take out anything dark. So let's go all the way to the highlights. So everything that's bright, softly fall that off. Nice soft radius so we don't get any um, weird jagged lines. And then hit apply. So that's now a mask that I drew, but only applying to the light areas in that masked area. Okay. With that, I can then pull the exposure down. Not too much, not like this, <laughs> but a little bit. So maybe a third of a stop, something like that just so that you don't get that weird halo-y glow behind something that's dark. Okay, and then finally, what we could do, if we wanted to, is go back to our background, and with our tree, because there's not much noise in this image, even though it's ISO 6400, we can afford with our tree to put a little touch of structure on. That's just going to get the leaves out in detail, some of the wood a bit more detailed. We could pull a touch of clarity, but be careful that you're not doing either of those in such a way that you drive a halo around those edges. The second you start seeing lines around the edges, whether it's dark or light, back away from clarity and back away from structure because you've probably overdone it. Um, where are we? Damien, could you use Refine and the Luma range together to fully remove the tree? Uh, by remove the tree, I think you mean from the mask, not delete the tree. Um, so yes, you can. Um, let's just go into here. Let's show actually our our grayscale mask. So here's our grayscale mask of that area that I drew. And on here, we can actually go to refine mask. And of course, on the radius, if we go, um, let me just go to cancel. So keep your eyes on the screen. 
let me undo that so there's our mask at the moment with that radius here around the tree you see how you've got this sort of slightly dark area it's where the radius of the luma range was starting to taper off as they got nearer to the tree if i go to refine mask which is a feature you right click on any layer with a mask go to refine mask it's just above luma range and then on there you'll see that this mask gets a lot crisper um, gets a lot more controlled you can do the reason that we don't tend to show it on here so i'm going to apply it on here it's done a very good job uh, let's just turn off our mask there so that's going to be a bit neater now around that tree but be careful with refined mask because what you may find is around some of the more nuanced detail areas um, you need to just keep an eye on it because sometimes it makes a decision that might not be the best um, for what you're trying to do so yes use refined mask but just make sure you check all around the edges of that mask to make sure it's got it right if it hasn't then of course you can erase and you can add extra stuff in with the brush but just don't rely on it being completely automatic and doing your job for you. You've still got two eyes in your head. You still need to use them to make sure that the mask is correct. OK, so that's sort of where I'd leave it with this. Of course, you can bump this thing. You know, we, we can make it a lot more saturated. We could make it, you know, we could uh, go on to our color editor. We could pick on these these pinks and we can saturate them up as well. We can, you know, we can do all that stuff. But I wouldn't. I'd leave this relatively natural. If anything on there, what we could afford to do on the background is maybe pull up the shadows just a touch more like that. And that's it. So if I go to before and after, there's our before. Here's the fun one. When you're watching an edit happen slowly, slowly, slowly in front of the screen, you don't notice how much of a difference each individual part of this is, is having. When we do the before and after stuff, that's when you notice how much of a change has actually occurred. So we go from a relatively flat image, which looked perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But now we've got that sort of glow of, um, I guess, the tropics or whatever. I'm not sure where it was taken. Um, but all of those little compound changes all add up to a very, very big and significant change at the end. That's what we're going for. It still needs to look natural. It still needs to look real. But what you'll find very easily is when you go back to the before, you might be surprised at how much of a change we've actually seen. Remember with all of these things, if it's too much, so if you look at this and think, Do you know what, that sky's a bit too dark now. Well, that's fine. We've got our sky layer here, and I've got the opacity thing up here on the layers um, palette. So I can pull down the opacity of that layer. I can even turn the layer completely off if I want to. But I can then control these things and taper some of these adjustments to keep them real. And that's all we're doing all the time is we're just tapering and changing and adjusting small things that add up to something different uh where are we so damien uh so yeah i also find that when using refine i need to go through several iterations of manual retouching yeah uh, the answer is there there is no perfect answer to getting a perfect mask around exactly what you wanted to mask because the computer doesn't know what you want to mask it can make some assumptions and it can soften radiuses and it can guess where edges are and stuff like that um but you know especially around things like tree leaves and human hair and stuff like that it does a good job but you still need to zoom right in and make sure that it's got the mask right okay uh so that was michael's shot uh jerry jerry since since you woke up especially early we'll edit one of your shots just for fun okay uh let's just get that comment off the screen okay so uh, I have no idea where this is, other than it's probably somewhere near Arizona or I don't know, maybe a guessing Arizona. Well, we'll see. Jerry, you'll have to let us know. OK, so first thing is, as always, let's go into our lens correction tab. Now, this one says manufacturer profile. That tells me, so it's a Sony, what was that, 6500? Um, the Sony camera has embedded the lens profile into the file. So manufacturer profile is not the same as generic, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Manufacturer profile means that the camera has actually embedded the detail that Capture One needs to know to make decisions around distortion and chromatic aberration and stuff like that. So manufacturer profile is good. Um, what I would do is go on to the little three dots and make sure you click on analyze to get it um, specific to that particular camera uh, and lens and sensor combo and so on. Um, we don't have to worry about distortion on here um, because it's say it's landscape, even if it has chopped some off, but let's just have a look. Yep, so just like before, at 30 millimeters in order to keep this lens completely straight and level you've lost some of the image through that crop so that's the you know, first tip out of all of these things today um, if you're shooting with a wide lens and you want to see just make sure if you want to see what the camera actually got go to your crop tool and see if it's or chopped any out because if you just load this picture in 
and Capture One applies the manufacturer profile, you won't even see the border that it's actually cut or chopped off. So just keep aware of that and always um, check your crop before you start editing. There might be something on the edge. In fact, in here, there sort of is. Um, I want more of this rock, and I don't mind if maybe it's a little bit uh, diffracted at the edges. That's fine. Um, we're at f8. That's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to leave this right out to the outside. And I've, I've just gained another couple of degrees worth of the view, so it was worth doing. On top of that, um, oh, there we are. Uh, so Coronado National Monument, uh, southeast of Tucson. I got the place right, sort of, state anyway. Um, so this seems to me to be a little bit off level. Now it may not be off level, but because of the um, the cloud formation over here and the shadow that it's causing, it just feels like it's leaning a little bit down to the right. So especially with this, where we don't have a strict line of the horizon, we've got all these hills and bumps and so on. I'm just gonna make a small adjustment just to follow that sort of line just to make it feel more level now it's a good job that i gave it a little more room on the sides because we're going to need some of that to level it up and it's just a visual thing that just feels more horizontal now obviously if you don't like that you can always play with it a bit but with the straightening thing just make sure it feels level um it's, it's more important that it feels level than it actually is level and what i mean by that is i've hung prints on walls before where it is absolutely 100 percent level you can put a spirit level against that line on the horizon it looks level because of the way that the image was composed it feels wrong so just be aware and, and just make sure that it feels correct and horizontal so with this one um there's actually a, not that much we're going to do with it to be honest uh, we're going to do a couple of little um, tweaks on there one is the white balance uh, i don't know if you see this on your screens but to me it feels a little bit slightly tinted towards green um, rather than the sort of uh, more neutral color, I guess. Um, now, which is weird because we've got actually a, a slight pink tint added into it, but it just feels a little too green. I can't really use our dropper on this image because there's nothing in here that feels like it should be middle gray. Maybe if I zoom into here, maybe that would be... Not sure it will, though. Let's, um, let's have a little try. Yeah, it's gone even more green. <laughs> more green still. Yeah, that's not good. Okay, so we're into manual territory. So again, white balance, a lot of this is personal preference. Um, it depends on how you remember the scene. If you remember it feeling more green like that, then stick with it. If you remember it feeling a bit warmer and a, and a bit more pink rather than green, then dial it in manually. Um, but I wasn't there, I'm just gonna have to guess a little bit, but I would sort of pull it up to maybe somewhere around there which just feels a bit more like the sort of sunset and low sun that you obviously have here in this particular time. Okay, um, with this all done, let's just see if we can get a bit more detail out of this image. So that's at 100%. Let's use our clarity tool and our structure tool to see if we can get some detail to pop. Yeah, that's pretty good. And the structure tool, not too much. Again, so just dial it back a little bit with structure, otherwise you're going to end up picking up all the uh, noise in the file, but you're also going to end up picking up um, some of those halos around the edges, which isn't, isn't particularly good. It doesn't look very nice. Okay, um, that's pretty good there. I'm just gonna, I think, put in a little gradient mask on the top. A really, really subtle one. So it's gonna start right at the top up here, all the way down, and I'm actually then gonna move it off the edge of the screen. So we're not even having 100% of anything up here. With that, I'm gonna pull down the exposure just a touch. I'm also going to adjust our white balance up there a little bit just to be a bit cooler. It's interesting. Okay. Now, don't do that too much. So the split white balance thing can look really cool, can look really funky. In fact, I'm just going to dial back the coolness a little bit in there. Splitting the white balance is fine as long as it makes sense in the scene. What doesn't make sense is if you've got, for example, um, a load of warm lights down below and then a load of cloud in the sky um, immediately in front of those warm lights but the cloud is now brutally cold that doesn't make sense the cloud would have reflected the same light that was um, occurring down below so you can get away with it in things like a stormy scene or a mountain scene or something like that but just think about does the image or does the scene look real don't try and split white balances just for fun only do it if it's going to work for that picture right uh, with that done, let's put in another, I'm just going to call that one Sky. 
I'm going to put another layer in and call this one left hand rocks so we know where we're going with it and again another gradient layer I could paint this in there's no need to really we just do that um, and with the left hand rocks I'm going to pull the exposure down a touch why because I want this rock and this rock to become a bit even so the next thing I'm going to do is create another one called oops right hand rocks um, and our right hand rocks layer so here's our gradient tool remember we don't have to use gradient tools always to cut light we can use them to add light as long as there's enough detail in the histogram so those two layers if you look if I turn them both off we had a very big discrepancy between this right hand side and the left hand side this in light this in dark by putting those two layers on so darkening one side lightening the other side we get a lot more evenness and the focus then goes back out into the desert floor or the, the valley floor with both of those layers I'm going to put up some clarity quite a decent boost of clarity just to get all of this detail and texture up here out um, and that's probably us sort of done um, we could pull our levels in oops sorry make sure you're on the right layer so that was just affecting the levels on the left hand rocks so background and let's pull our levels in but I think you're going to lose some of the feel of this picture it's going to go a little bit too harsh instead what we'll do is we'll use the curve so we're going to leave the shadows exactly where they were and we're just going to pop those mid to highlights up a little bit we're just going to raise them a bit without pushing the shadows any darker um, and that's sort of where I'd get to uh, let's go to before and after so again it's subtle um, there's our before looks a bit more washed out looks a bit more muddy um, slightly more green um, and there's our after which has got a lot more focus here on this area that's illuminated by the Sun that's what we're going for we're just looking at where are we trying to draw the viewers eye towards what we're certainly not doing um, oh there, there we go Jerry the mountain on the right is in Mexico that's cool like that shot of a border cool um, should, isn't there meant to be a wall there somewhere or something oh, I don't know I, I stopped following that stuff a while ago so um, the the whole feel of this picture changes in two ways one the white balance two the crop so if we go back to our previous one I'm just going to um, let's create a clone of that variant and I'm going to reset it completely so command and R or uh, control R on, on Windows that resets everything so be very careful with that resets everything back to how it was imported um, which is different to the before and after before and after respects the crop that you've done whereas the reset doesn't it just blows it out um, completely gone so there's our before our true before and there's our after and the feel of these two pictures then becomes very very different mostly because we've given it a letterbox so we've got rid of this stuff up here which wasn't really adding much we've lost some of this stuff down here in the bottom and we've gone into that real sort of cinematic view of mountain in Mexico turns out with um with two on so on in the uh, in the distance pretty cool okay so next one if anyone's got any questions by the way as we're going then let me know um, otherwise we'll just carry on and we'll blast through some of these so this one uh, ah, is this the one that I had the question on yes um, so there was a question that came in with this one from Brian about uh, lens profiles so lens profiles and the frustration that Brian's having is that the lens that he shot this on which is a Canon uh, 70 to 300 um, the EF so uh, it's a, actually a really handy lens it's quite a, a compact lens for the difference in uh, in zoom length that you've got however his frustration is that you can't necessarily see uh, it doesn't automatically pick up the lens and apply the profile the reason is and you're not going to like this um, because capture one doesn't include that profile so if it can't find an exact match for that lens it will not apply a profile and it will apply the generic profile there's nothing necessarily wrong with the generic profile it's just not designed specifically around that piece of glass you've got in front of the camera a lot of people have asked a similar question in terms of how do I get my lens on this list the, the brutal answer is you're not going to find a list supported in capture one of every single lens out on the market the way that this is done is literally they have to go and get the lenses they take them into the lab and they spend 
ages and ages and ages profiling every single different you know every aperture every um, different lighting condition different uh, lighting directions and see how the lens behaves they'll they're going to do that for popular lenses as in max popular lenses or for lenses that are pretty high end so certainly the l series glass um, in canon's case if you look at a lot of these you'll find they're an l lens um, or more to give you some context i had a bit of a um, challenge with this because when i got a little while ago a, um, a canon eos r um, to play with so the kit lens that comes with neos r is an l series lens it's 24 to 105. it took until version 20.1 to get that lens on the supported lens list so even one that was you know what i believed was quite popular in comparison to other lenses that are out there it wasn't um, and it took some time to get it on the list if you want to bump things up the list the same with support calls the same with bugs the same with feature requests the lens profiles are no different go to support.capture1.com ask them to support that lens if you're on your own you might be waiting for a while until more and more people buy it and, and they see it you might find that they just add it at some point um, but what i guarantee is if no one requests for that lens to be added and it doesn't increase in popularity it's not going to get added because it doesn't make sense to so with all these lens profiles if yours is missing go to support.capture1.com lodge it as a request or a feature request and you're going to be able to to pull that in um but just seen pop up on my screen so good point brian uh, none of my lenses automatically load not even my l lenses that is weird um because absolutely i can see in here it's loaded it in um do, do, do. Yes, I'm assuming you've got the latest version of firmware on your camera, but really I mean, it shouldn't matter at the, that stage, given it's a 6D, it's been around long enough within Capture One. Um, honestly, I'd log a support call, um, send in a, a version of the raw file that you're having a problem with. Um, this one won't load in because the lens just isn't there um, for sure. But if you've got one that does have the lens loaded or send it up to us, so put the upload, use the upload tool, Send me one that's got a raw with a lens that is in the list. We'll load it in and see what it's um, see what it's doing. But you know, at the end of the day, we're probably going to push it into support um, to see what they can see what they can see as it comes in. That said, all that said, with the generic profile, there's nothing actually wrong with using the generic profile. So let's tick on the chromatic aberration. When you use a generic profile, because Capture One doesn't know what lens you're using, instantly it's going to do that analyze. It's going to create a unique aberration map for this lens on this sensor for this image. So that's actually a time saver. <laughs> um, now, at F10, we might have a little bit of diffraction out up here. Maybe let's just turn this on. Yeah, OK, it's sharpened it up. So I don't know whether you can see that on your screens there. I'm going to go into 400 um, percent. So diffraction correction, you, all of these things in general, we want to reduce the number of adjustments we're making if they're not necessary. But if they are necessary, then these things do the right job. So diffraction correction, I'm going to tick it in a second. You can see on the screen. So watch in three, two, one. OK, you should hopefully have seen that got a little bit sharper around the branches. Let me just turn it off again. And on again now. So that diffraction correction has sharpened up, certainly around the edges of the scene, um, and that's going to help, especially if we're using the full width of this um, this image. Um, but, oh, I've opened a can of worms on lenses. So uh, there are zero Samyang lenses officially supported. Uh, I have three lenses with no profiles. Uh, I have a Samyang lens. Uh, yes, and I agree it's not supported, um, in part because it, I, mean, the, the, I don't know what lenses you have, um, Barrett, but... Um, the one that I have, I think it's a 14 millimeter or something like that that we put on a, a Canon for, for night stuff. Um, in reality, that particular lens is an awful lens um, for me. Um, it's it's distorted. It's got huge diffraction issues. Um, it, it's got some um, barrel distortion there as well. It, it fringes really easily. It flares really easily. There's a lot of stuff on there that I would argue is very difficult to correct for. And what you might find, I don't know, I'm not talking on their behalf here, but you might find that actually the guys at Capture One are sort of in a place of, you know what, um, we, we're never going to be able to correct for that lens. The generic tools will correct most of that stuff. So if you've got a lens with heavy fringing, um, you can use the purple fringing to fix it. If you've got a lens with heavy um, diffraction, then the diffraction correction on generic does a very good job. It's just done it here on this lens. Um, but you're going to find there are some lenses out there that just 
it, to be able to say that it is corrected for that lens wouldn't be true so they may try and back away from that and i sort of don't blame them on on those ones um okay so here's our scene um this is from mem oh yeah brian of course brian hello brian uh, brian lives in jackson hole we like we like brian because i'm very jealous of brian because i like jackson hole a lot um and this is the tetons um so what we have in here is really cool um, winter view we've got some you know, nice blue fluffy clouds up here we've got our um, our mountains nothing particularly overexposed nothing particularly underexposed actually because if we look at our histogram look at that bottom part of it there's a gap between at the point that the data falls off and the left hand wall or the zero wall um on the uh, on the histogram itself and again using that orange bar so as i move my mouse around the image everywhere under the cursor is popping up on that histogram under the orange bar and it's showing me exactly where it sits so in this case it's sitting in, in these trees definitely down in that black section it's not shadows it's it's the bottom sort of four or five percent this tree down here for sure it's in the black section but none of it is underexposed it's just sat very heavily in the shadows so that's great because it means that we can now play with the data that's in that histogram so first off let's have a look at our white balance um this is auto white balance it's, it's our shot let's just see what we get if we try and take some off of the shade side of the mountain um so it's a lot warmer mm -hmm. don't like that at all um even if we go to snow we get way too cool so it's somewhere in between these two um so let's go do this manually i'm just going to pull that up a touch there just to neutralize that so kelvin first follow it with tint so you're going to use your kelvin to control how warm the light feels and then tint if as a result of any of that warming or cooling you've introduced a green or a, a magenta um, tint overall so that's why you do it in that order kelvin controls the color temperature the warmth of light sometimes as you make things warmer they can end up with a slight green tint sometimes as you make things cooler they can end up with a, a slightly magenta tint so you then use that tint to counter anything that's happened to those tones as a result of the warmth of light right um so first thing let's try and pull up some detail on these trees now we've already said as we moved our mouse around it sat in the black section rather than just the shadows if i pull up shadows remember please that shadows also include blacks so i can use the shadow slider and it's going to pull up those trees as well as anything that's just sat in the shadow section not necessarily in the blacks area if i reset that so double click on any slider and capture one you reset let's pull up the blacks alone you notice that's just picking on the trees so i'm just going to do that again so you can see if i pull up shadows it's the trees but it's also all of this lake bed down here or river bed um, it's all of the, the ripples in the river along here it's all of this stuff out on the back side because it's everything in this bottom quarter pretty much if i do the same level so 50 ish but in black we only pick up on the trees now i've done it over the top on here just to, to show you so it's only picking up the the areas of that histogram that were fully in that bottom four or five percent so why do you use one over the other well it depends on what you're trying to pick up now in both cases if i pull up blacks too much or pull whites down too much you end up with this flattening in the image and it starts to look like a cartoon um so it's been a while since i've done this so let's just do it for fun pull our highlights down our whites down our shadows up and our blacks up and now we have effectively a pencil drawing it's a cartoony image with absolutely no real contrast in it whatsoever we you can see on the histogram we've bunched everything up in the middle the reason is we've pulled the whites down we've pulled the highlights down we pulled the blacks up and the shadows up we've crushed it all in the middle and we've flattened out the image we've lost all the contrast in it if that's what you wanted to do then great but most people don't so let's just reset that tool so this one here the little reset button there um if i just want to focus on pulling up those trees then i just use the black slider but not that much so maybe only 20 that's enough and now i've got a decision to make do i want to bring the rest of the shadows up as well but maybe not by quite so much because these things are compound so if i now pull shadows up as well not only is that pulling all of the rest of the sort of 20 percent or so of the dark areas in the histogram up but it's also bringing those blacks in the black areas in there that i've already moved up by 20 up again so blacks gets a double boost but it's a boost that's surrounded by everything in the shadows coming up at the same time so it looks less cartoon like 
if I set black to 40, it's going to look like a cartoon. If I set shadows to 40, it's going to look a little bit flatter. If I use shadows a bit and blacks a bit, you compound on top of the black slider with the, um, with the shadows and it just feels more smooth, but it keeps a lot more contrast. That's what we're aiming for here. So, uh, oh, question in there, where are we? From Hugh, uh, sometimes it helps to increase the saturation to see the color and temperature and tint. Yeah, it, it can. Um, just be careful. <laughs> um, because if you increase the saturation, minor changes in Kelvin, for example, can seem like they've had a massive effect when actually they haven't. Um, so it, with all of these things, the one thing I would actually, I've just done the opposite here, unfortunately, um, but for the demonstration purposes, but one thing I would consider doing is pulling up your shadows a little bit. If something's underexposed, pull up your shadows before you make any white balance adjustments, just to make sure, for example, in this scene, that we haven't made those trees completely putrid green or pink or whatever as a result of that tint change, because you wouldn't have seen it when they were sat down here in the shadows as much anyway. Okay, so that's our trees brought up. So let's just do a before and after even just with that. And that's a big difference already. So that looks pretty good. Um, with our trees brought up, we're going to make a couple of changes up here in the sky. And we're also going to introduce a lot more contrast on those mountain tops. And we're not going to do it with the contrast tool. We're going to do it with clarity. So first thing, let's have a look at our curve because what we can afford to do on here, look at all this extra space in here. Just because you see extra space in your histogram does not mean you have to fill it. I see this quite often, people using um, that every single shot is to fill the whole histogram. Don't worry about filling the whole histogram. Yes, from a, from a printing point of view, if the white is 255 and the black is zero, then obviously that makes sense and you've got the full gamut of, of uh, range in between. But in reality, it's perfectly fine to have a shot that doesn't fill the entire histogram based on the mood you're trying to get across. Let's go back just quickly onto Michael's image earlier. We're not touching this bit on the top of the histogram. And if I did, oops, let's just make sure I'm on the right layer. If I did, it starts to become almost harsh to look at. We've lost that subdued color, the subdued light that happened as a result of leaving the highlights alone and leaving them out of the, um, out of the shot or not pushing things up into them. Same with here. I can, if I really want to, use all of that available histogram and force this to be really, really vivid. It starts to feel a bit overdone. There's too much contrast. It's too much for our eyes to look at. It starts to feel uncomfortable. So be really careful with this stuff. You don't need to make the histogram stretch all the way from 0 to 255. By all means, do if that's giving the effect that you want. But there's no rule that says you have to do that. In this case, I might pull it down a bit just to pop it a little bit. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have a nice little gradient layer. I'm not worried about this tree. If that becomes a bit crisper, then so be it. Um, a nice gradient layer that sort of covers this mountain top here. And with that gradient layer set to natural, I'm going to pull up our clarity. And look at that difference there between the mountain there and there. So what I could do now is actually pick on this blue if I wanted to, if I really, really want to pull this out and I can almost have a polarization effect on this. If I click on the blue there, I can pull that lightness down, but pull the saturation up just a touch, not big numbers. Don't do any wild swings or anything like that, but it starts to feel like I put a polarizing filter on almost because everything's just got a bit sharper and a bit more, um, a bit more responsive um, as you look at it. So I could also get away with a little bit of structure and structure is going to come into its own around some of this stuff here around the tree. So I'm being unfair here. I'm going into 400%. Um, but as I pull structure up, you're going to see all this detail come up. Again, be careful with structure and clarity that you don't end up and just try and find a line that I can show you there that you don't end up with these halos. You see this dark line here along that mountain top. That's where we've overdone structure and overdone clarity a little bit. So just be careful with them, dial them in enough to get you the effect you want, but not too much because you end up with some of these byproducts, which don't, well, they don't look very nice, let's put it that way. Uh, with our top adjustment for the sky, I could afford, if I wanted to, to push this tint just a little bit up um, away from the green again. Um, and down here in the mountain itself, I'm going to do something a little bit weird now. So there's our sky. 
I'm going to create a new layer called mountain and I'm going to be very 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 rough with uh, the mask I'm about to draw uh, oh, Brian just said this was a very bright day with fast moving clouds yeah it was uh, particularly taken with the clouds cloud shadows in the mountains yeah um, especially when it's really bright I and mean, you're looking directly into the reflection back from that snow the bright white clouds and then you've got this silhouette of trees in front of you this is where the dynamic range of your camera is really important a lot of the cameras that are being announced at the moment are still emblazoned or battled in battled in this whole x number of megapixels and blah 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 they don't talk about dynamic range dynamic range is the killer for for this stuff if you've got a camera with an amazing dynamic range i would sacrifice megapixel count over it any day um, because it's dynamic range that allows your camera to see more and more of a scene at the same time um, without needing necessarily a filter uh, in front of the lens because filters come with their own little challenges too okay you can see there i've drawn a very rough mask let me uh, go to a grayscale mask you can see very very rough um, with that mask i'm going to go into my curve and i'm going to set a couple of points so leave that bit i don't want to make the bright parts any brighter leave that bit i don't want to change the shadows but this part in the middle I want the mid-tones to get brighter and darker depending on which side of this little point they sit might not actually let me just undo that a second I'm going to do it on the luma curve instead of the RGB um, so I don't want to change our saturation of things especially that blue channel because there's quite a lot of blue in here but this will allow me just to make those mountains pop a touch more than they were before so again if i go before and after now again this is personal preference this is this is where you want to get to with that mountainside what i see isn't the same as what you will see the same circumstances in the same scene but to me that sort of pops a little bit more it gives it a bit more presence in that mountain and then of course with the mountain on its own we could increase a little bit of structure um, just to get some of that back too if i wanted to on the mountain i could pull in our highlights and whites a touch just don't end up in this weird seesaw where you're using curves to brighten the highlights and then you're using HDR to pull down the highlights or or vice versa. Just just keep an eye on what you've done already so that you don't end up with a seesaw backwards and forwards of things. Um, and then overall, if we wanted to, back to our background, we could pull our saturation up a couple of clicks um, and that's it. Um, to me, there's probably a little bit of a leveling thing going on here. Um, so let me just give this a try just by moving that across there yeah that feels a bit better um, just in that sense this tree here I actually quite like on the left hand side of the frame but some people might choose to sort of come into a crop uh, and we go back to original so we don't massively crop it but yeah you, you may choose to go in really tight crop um, into there but to me I kind of like the uh, the tree frame on the left hand side Let's go before and after so there's our before again nothing wrong with the first shot this is all about getting the best out of what your camera captured but if we go back to after look at that detail in those trees that we didn't have before look at the the contrast in this mountain so let's just go into 100 percent here there's our before it's a little bit murky because I mean, obviously the teams are quite a way away as well um, but you've got that sort of low lying um light which is um it's also bouncing around off the snow so you're getting quite a flat look on those mountains in the distance and then as we pull across those adjustments we get all this hard cold um, really vivid and really um, harsh um, view of the mountains including because we upped that clarity and structure we've got a lot more detail back in those rocks so we go from there to there um, along with the, obviously the color change so we've, we've changed our white balance and we've changed the color editor to um, pop the blues a little bit more as well but overall that just feels like a more interesting shot to look at um, than the original capture was in raw um, same shot just with a couple of tweaks okay guys so um, that's probably us for today that's probably the least I've done in quite a while it's three images so uh, this one we go from where are we there to there so we changed it to feel a bit more like a tropical sunset than it was before um, Jerry's shot all we've done is effectively brought the viewer back to looking at this area here in the center rather than this sort of um, muddy look around here we've lost some of the sky up here to bring that focus back as well um, and the end result being that and then Brian's shot of the Tetons so let's just go to a clone that variant and reset so there's our original one 
and there's our finished one so just one other thing on there so uh with george or Huawei, um either one hello uh so what i sometimes do is first lift the shadows and then slightly reduce the blacks to reserve contrast um there's yeah there's nothing wrong with that um again it becomes a bit of a seesaw so just always remember that blacks are included in shadows not vice versa and the same with highlights so whites are included in highlights so effectively one is a subset of the other but one is like a master control and one is a more finite detail um, within those very very bright or very very um, dark areas of the histogram um, so yeah perfectly um, perfectly reasonable way to do it and, and all I'm doing effectively is I'm doing the opposite to that but to compound it so I'm saying you know bring up the shadows a little bit but then bring up the blacks even more um, what you're doing effectively is bringing up the shadows for example um, and then pulling down um, the the blacks of the darkest part themselves perfectly fine perfectly reasonable way of doing things so that's cool okay guys uh so um that's us for today um remember go on to facebook you'll find that group um we can talk about some of these images today um, but also anything that's coming up um and there's a couple of examples on there um, already from people that have uh, done some editing on what we've shown um and remember you've got the pro tip stuff um on youtube go to that channel you can watch um, in-depth stuff on things like clarity tools and brightness and exposure the milky way one will go back up onto youtube once we fix the sound problem that will hopefully be today or tomorrow um but in the meantime remember to keep uploading all those pictures um so again if you want another raw um file to have a look at that lens problem um brian then then send that through but in general to everyone um send your images through remember it has to be a raw file we can't play with tiffs or uh, jpegs and um, remember to include your name and if you've got an issue with that picture and in the meantime um we will see you i think next wednesday so wednesday the 22nd i think it is um, for the next one of these sessions. Um, but in the meantime, grab us on any of those channels and we'll see you later. Cheers. Bye.